This video is brought to you by Honey. What's up guys, Helen here. Now, here at Wisecrack, we love our movie theaters. The huge screens, the artery-clogging popcorn, the neon 90s carpeting, and the warm welcome from Maria Menounos. So now enjoy your first look. But the prognosis for movie theaters lately has been, uh... Not great, Bob! Given the whole plague thing, that might feel like a no-brainer, but it turns out that these shortfalls have actually been years in the making, and no one seems quite sure how to feel about the whole thing, with folks like director James Gunn championing the whole movie experience, while purists like Christopher Nolan basically threatening to burn the whole damn place down if his movies aren't shown on a screen the size of Times Square's Eminem billboard. So is it time to start planning cinema's funeral? Or have rumors of its demise been greatly exaggerated? Let's find out in this Wisecrack edition, Are Movie Theaters Dead? Before we get into it, I want to give a shout out to this week's sponsor, Honey. Now, if there's something I love more than eating a fresh tub of popcorn while watching a new movie in a theater full of strangers, it's getting a good deal. And sometimes I can get just a little obsessive with finding the absolute best deals when shopping online, which is why Honey has become an absolute lifesaver. Honey is like a magical best friend who hangs out in your browser and waits patiently to help you master the art of online shopping. It automatically scours the internet for the best promo codes while you're shopping. I used to spend so much time searching for discount codes on my own, only to enter them at checkout and find out they were duds. Honey makes sure this never happens again. Recently, I've been shopping for socks, and I figured, surely there aren't deals available for stylish foot sweaters, but out of nowhere, Honey dropped a promo code that saved me a ton. And now, my sock collection takes up my whole top drawer. Just saying. And no matter what you shop for online, Honey already works for all the things you're already buying and all the websites you're already buying them on. Most importantly, it's just really, really fun to shop with Honey. Every time I save money, it's like my magical fairy deals mother was looking out for me. And and of course, more savings means more money to use to find even more deals with Honey. So sign up for Honey for free by going to joinhoney.com slash wisecrack or by clicking the link in the description. And now, back to the show. Now, we all know movie theaters are suffering. Ticket sales fell 80% in 2020, the lowest tally recorded at the box office for nearly 40 years. It's tempting to blame this entirely on the pandemic, and it's true that there's not enough horse dewormer in the world to keep cinemas from feeling the effects of the coronavirus. Just kidding, please listen to the FDA. But anyway, if you draw back the curtains and look at the full picture, it's clear that movie theaters have actually been in trouble for a while. 2017 and 2019 were the worst box office years since 1995, and that's back when the worst association most of us had with Corona was a mediocre beer. Apologies to Dom Toretto. And while cinemas have been declining, a whopping 200 streaming services have also been fighting for our eyes. Now, for those of us who love movies, the notion that our local Lowe's MC 7000 draft house might be empty by the time we're ready to return is pretty galling. We all have the sort of vivid movie-going memories that just can't be created anywhere else. I mean, if movie theaters didn't exist, then Tiffany Haddish would have never had that life-altering experience she had while gazing into Nick Cage's eyes. As I was achieving a, um, momentous moment that I had never experienced in my life. Um, I opened my eyes and the eyes of Nicolas Cage are looking into my eyes super big, right? And that's just not a world I want to live in. But are movie theaters really at death's door? Because as it turns out, it wouldn't be the first time we've heard that particular song. Played once then. For all time's sake. Here's what film critic A.O. Scott had to say. The history of cinema is in part an anthology of premature obituaries. Sound, color, television, the suburbs, the VCR, the internet, they were all going to kill off moviegoing, and none succeeded. Cultural forms and the social and private rituals that sustain them have a way of outlasting their funerals. Basically, people get upset just about every time a new form of media comes around, solemnly declaring that it's killing off the real art that they already had. Socrates was famous, amongst philosophy nerds at least, for denouncing this newfangled thing called written language. He believed that it would have a corrupting influence on young minds, who would no longer have to store every line of every epic poem in their big ol' ancient brains. And later on, after togas had gone out of fashion and radios had come in, parents worried that the hip new sounds coming through the airwaves would distract kids from their precious reading time. We've even already had a dress rehearsal for the great streaming versus cinemas debate. When television first became popular, it was feared that no one would bother leaving their house to see a movie anymore. And theaters responded swiftly, introducing gimmicks like smell-o-vision and 3D to try to entice viewers back, just as modern cinemas are counting on IMAX screens and 4DX showings to get people in the door. But while this might not be a new fight, it's a fight all the same, and shots have already been fired in both directions. 
See, major theater chains have traditionally insisted upon an exclusive theatrical window of 90 days, because the chance to see a film right away is a big part of their sales pitch. And they have defended this setup pretty vigorously in the past. You might remember major chains refusing to show films like The Irishman because Netflix wouldn't give them a clear run before making it available for streaming. And in the past, streaming services and studios have mostly just taken this on the chin in the manner of old Joe Pesci. It's what it is. But more recently, streaming and studio giants have been taking a harder line against theater chains. Universal shifted streaming rights for blockbuster films to kick in after only 31 days in theaters, with an even shorter theater-only window for smaller releases. And Disney's done a mix of premium streaming and theatrical release. Warner Media's decision to put all of its 2021 blockbusters on HBO Max has seen Christopher Nolan branded as the worst streaming service, while Patty Jenkins said all the films that streaming services are putting out look like fake movies. So it's safe to say that things have gotten a little tense. And part of the reason for all this tension is that many filmmakers genuinely believe that the theatrical experience is key to the movie they want audiences to see. Like Denis Villeneuve, who made it clear that he was not stoked about his epic space worm drama Dune going straight to HBO Max. The way it happened, I'm still not happy. Frankly, to watch Dune on a television, the best way I can compare it is to drive a speedboat in your bathtub. For me, it's ridiculous. It's a movie that has been made as a tribute to the big screen experience. Plenty of filmgoers feel the same way too. No matter how big your TV is or how fancy a sound system you're rocking, it can't compare to the scope and quality of a theatrical viewing, and that can make a big difference for visual spectacles like Dune. Not to mention the in-cinema benefits of more accurate aspect ratio, improved digital resolution, or the simple joy of seeing a film projected on actual film reels. But it's also about more than screen size. The thing that really makes movie going such a sacred experience for cinephiles is that it's a communal activity that connects us with others, even if we're mostly just sitting in silence. As scholar Jean Matry writes, each individual audience member is alone, by himself, looking at the world presented to him. Yet this isolation does not separate the individual from the group. He does not communicate with his fellows, but he sees and feels with them, if not like them. A kind of underlying connection is established between audience members shut up within their own contemplation. Communication exists at the level of feelings and fascination. It's why it's so satisfying to hear the laughter of a full theater, or feel everyone collectively holding their breath at the height of a horror scene. What's more, seeing a film on the big screen arguably creates a stronger emotional relationship between the viewer and the actors. Indeed, when movie theaters first began showing dramatic films, early audiences were captivated by the closeness they felt to the new stars, far more so than they felt with theatrical performers. As critic Stephanie Zakarik argues, big faces are just more evocative than those viewed on a small screen. She writes, Seen large, a great face is both map and mirror, a key to our own emotions, to those we may have buried or forgotten, but also, perhaps, to those we haven't yet experienced. I've often wondered if the faces of actors aren't one of our best means for fostering empathy. It seems possible that we feel a stronger relationship with the character we saw on the big screen than with one we saw on our 13-inch laptops while simultaneously playing Candy Crush and doing laundry. Still, not everyone is so sold on the importance of seeing movies at the theater. Director and man who absolutely should not be allowed to tweet ever, James Gunn, was decidedly more laid back about where people saw The Suicide Squad. He argued that movies don't last because they're seen on the big screen, and used Jaws as an example. There are now whole generations who have only ever caught it on TV, and it seems to be doing just fine. For Gunn, a good movie is a good movie, no matter how you see it. The content matters, not the medium. And even for self-proclaimed film purists, it's undeniable that streaming services have their benefits. Convenience is obvious. Cost matters too. After decades of chronic wage stagnation, a night at the movies just isn't nearly as affordable for a lot of Americans as it used to be. But streaming has also done a lot to make cinema more broadly accessible in other ways. From people with disabilities that make movie going difficult or impossible, to those who live in smaller towns with limited theatrical options, the rise of Netflix and co can allow everyone to get in on the zeitgeist at the same time. And hey, this sounds an awful lot like the sort of communal connection-building experience that movie theater lovers champion. And with so many people physically geographically or economically excluded from the movie world when IRL theaters are the only option, there's no denying that streaming services have done a lot to democratize the world of cinema. Still, we think there's hope for lovers of Netflix and chilling and movie theaters alike. Because the truth is that the current panic about cinemas is likely to be another false death knell. For the most part, anyway. 
after so long cooped up at home, people are seriously missing the big shared social experience the cinema offers. And once it's safe, you'd expect them to jump at the opportunity. And that's exactly what's happened in China. In January, Chinese theaters set a new box office record for New Year's Day by taking in $92 million, which was almost double the previous record. And China's the world's biggest box office, so Hollywood will likely be able to keep the lights on a little while longer based on that alone. And there's every reason to believe the industry will make something like a full recovery in time. The elite number nerds at PricewaterhouseCoopers, you know, the people who mostly correctly hand out the envelopes at the Oscars, This is not a joke. Moonlight has won Best Picture. have even predicted that the worldwide box office could hit something like $42 billion in 2024. And that recovery will be bolstered by the fact that many big chains are making an even bigger effort to seduce film watchers back into their arms by adding things like digital concession ordering, private theater rentals, and better loyalty programs. Not to repeat ourselves, is there an echo in here? But we've been here before too. During the 1918 flu pandemic, Moving Picture World, a major trade paper, recommended theaters take advantage of their closures to apply soap and water, fresh paint, and slick up a bit in order that theaters may be fresh and clean to welcome back the crowds who will surely flock back to theaters, eager to be entertained which seems like a pretty baseline standard for any public gathering place, but we digress. And it seems to have worked. Folks definitely flocked back to the movies after the 1918 pandemic ended. It turns out, if you make cinemas nicer places to be, people are more likely to go there. So cinemas probably aren't going to die anytime soon. Still, the pandemic and the changing world of entertainment have recalibrated their place in society. Rather than occupying the very center of our popular culture, as they did back in the days of The Empire Strikes Back or even The Phantom Menace, movie theaters are now going to be widely accepted as one option among others for watching a movie. For some, they'll still be the only true way to experience a movie. For others, they'll remain a pricey, unnecessary, or even unattainable alternative to watching a Netflix film on the couch. And for plenty in the middle, they'll be just one platform amongst a litany of choices for when they feel like staring at a screen. But what do you think, Wisecrack? Are we on the brink of losing something sacred? Or should Scorsese and his buddies Netflix and chill the F out? Let us know what you think in the comments. Thanks, as always, to our patrons for all your support. Hit that like button like it's going out of business, and don't forget to ring the bell. And as always, thanks for watching. Peace.